panel and speakers for this evening and kickstart the literary extravaganza. One of our speakers on the panel tonight is an award-winning author of 18 books of fiction and non-fiction, including the great Indian novel Inglorious Empire and the recently published The Paradoxical Prime Minister. A third term member of parliament representing Trivandapuram, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. With him will be our festival co-director and one of Britain's greatest great historians and the best-selling author of many books, William Dalrymple. Please welcome William Dalrymple and Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Shashi and I have been doing a sort of double act on Empire now for a while. Um, and and uh, you won't, won't get much argument between us. It's it's a, this is the problem we agree with yeah, too much. Well, then we disagree, but anyway. But this evening I will, I will allow uh, Shashi, as the moderator here, to, uh, to spool out his arguments. And then I'll turn into a vicious critic uh, and, uh, and play the devil's advocate and uh, throw golf balls at you to. Perfidious Albion. Perfidious Albion. Two faces as ever. <laughs> um, so, yes, I mean, we've done this, first of all, at the Supreme Court. And then, for those of you that don't know this extraordinary story, we, we, the Supreme Court, there was this wonderful debate on empire when we started off, Shashi and I, saying the empire was not such a wonderful thing, and, the, and the, the, an opposition team. And they had, I think, 90% of the audience voting with them before the debate. They took, a vote, they took a vote at the beginning, and by the time we finished, it was 90% the opposite direction, which is exactly how it should be. But then, shortly on the heels of that, Shashi went to the Oxford Union and made a, a, a further advance of these arguments uh, in a debate on whether reparations were appropriate for the ravages of empire. And that became a story itself, just to tell us about the, the, the and the, and the aftermath of that, and the, 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 the aftermath. <laughs> well, it was uh, the Oxford Union's uh, debate, and they had chosen the topic. I must confess, I'm not personally big on reparations as an idea, only because I'm not sure that it makes any sense to put a monetary value on the colossal uh, damage done by British colonialism in India. Just take one example, how do you put a value on the 35 million unnecessary lives lost uh, thanks to British creative and British royal feminine. Uh, so reparations in the monetary sense were not my theme, but I accepted the invitation as an opportunity to, as you say, advance the arguments about why empire was a bad idea. And I made that speech, we did win the debate, and once again in one of the situations where in Oxford, as in the Commons, you move into division lobbies, and so many people wanted to move into our lobby that the post-debate reception got delayed by half an hour so that people could filter through and be counted. So it was a big success, but even then, you know, a student debate, we forgot and moved on. But a few weeks later, three or four weeks later, the Oxford Union put this thing up on the internet, and as is my vote, I tweeted it. Uh, where about well, one, seven million. Well, at that point it wasn't seven million, I think it was half that size, but in any case, the blessed thing went viral. Within 24 hours, he had been down with his Whether it was uh, Andrew Roberts, whether it was Lawrence James, there uh, are three or four 
British writers who had made a fair bit of money and success out of writing about the empire. They had all been on the side of those advocates of the greatest things since life's or the force of life's uh, And that, uh, in fact, Ferguson updated the argument of the 21st century by saying, actually, India's success and globalization was a result of Britain having laid the foundations through its empire. That's all the nonsense. So it became, I thought, all the more important to restore this. And in fact, uh, uh, when my publisher talked to me about writing it, I saw a poll conducted by the British Boarding Organization, YouGov, which I gather disproportionately asked young people, what's that for YouGov. But in any case, they um, uh, came up with a figure that year that 59% of people they pulled thought the empire was a good thing and wanted it back. And I thought, my gosh, you know, how would it be if children in Nazi, in, 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 sorry, children in Germany said they'd love to have the Nazis back? Because there really isn't very much difference. Arguably, uh, over a longer period of time, and the more victims uh, in the British Empire in India. So in any case, so the moral urgency of responding to the scene. I mean, I wrote the book, and it did go. Uh, it was very successful in India. Actually, really, in all fairness, it's been far more successful in India than anywhere else in the world. Though you you you've kindly mentioned elsewhere that it, it, it hit the bestseller list listen in London, which it did. Uh, in India, it has now become the best-selling hardback book of all time on any subject, uh, yeah, other, other than textbooks. So, so it has found a uh, struck a chord and it's woken people up to the reality. I mean, as I said to young audiences when I first was introduced to the book, I said, if you don't know where you're coming from, how do you appreciate where you're going? So this is not just history, this is about who we are today. Let's move to specifics and, and we'll take you through the next 20 minutes the different arguments you make. Um, let's start off with the idea that, that Britain gave India political unity. Well, I mean, that's so amongst the many arguments the British like to make uh, about what they did for us, um, this is the this is what there wasn't any India before we came here, so, to which uh, I'm afraid. The evidence is considerable on the other side of the ledger. First of all, that for about 3,000 years, there was an idea of India, going back, in fact, to the Vedas, the whole notion of Bharatvarsh, the land between the mountains and the seas. Um, but more than that, um, there were multiple ideas. There was a religious idea, Diane Eck, the Harvard scholar, has written about how this entire civilizational space in the subcontinent was knit together by countless tracts of pilgrimage, but you also have a political idea because the Sandra is actually doing absolute brown tricks and peregrations. Up and down for you know, 3,000, 2,000 years. And then you've got the political idea which goes back to the earliest empires, the Mauryas in the third century BC, tried to conquer the entire subcontinent, <laughs> made it a long way down and well into what's today Tamil Nadu. Uh, and successive empires all tried to do the same thing. They ran up to the Mughals who almost seemed to feel that the job of governance was incomplete until they subdued the entire subcontinent. Aurangzeb, who was flourishing in northern India, who in 1700 uh, had a hundred million pounds in revenues, which exceeded that of every single crowned head in Europe put together. Aurangzeb died in futile attempts to conquer the Deccan and the South. So this need to unite the entire uh, subcontinent under them was, was an impulsion of pretty much every Indian ruler. The only thing was that of course communication. The the north, the well, a little bit, but no, they never got that far. Not even Vijayanagar, which was the most powerful southern empire ever, never quite made it. So the Cholas the Ganges, they got it. Very briefly. What was it, 20 years, something like that, that they, they got that far? Well, southern credentials, yeah. Exactly. I know yeah. you're helping me, and I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot. Yes, we in the south will conquer the north one day. Yeah. Now, <laughs> but coming back to this, this whole business. No, no, who's who's who testing? No. To our civilization, man, not 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 through the force of arms. But um, you know what Sanoji Naidu famously said about the North, you know, the only culture they have is agriculture. So uh, <laughs> so we would realize and civilize that as the British attempted to civilize us. No, but coming back to more serious matters. Uh, so you have this notion uh, of unity, and of course. Given modern communications, given letter room systems, uh, undoubtedly somebody would have done it. The British happened to get there at the right time, which was indeed the 
18th century, which is when they really started taking over territories. And I would say William's book, The Anarchy, by the way, is a very detailed description of the irresistible rise of the East India Company during this period of the anarchy in India, when things were literally falling apart and the center could not hold. But at that time, you really had this, this, uh, this company that was able to do it. There were other contenders in the fray. I, I've often argued that the Marathas uh, were actually making extraordinary headway. Um, at one point, they got all the way up to Calcutta. They stopped by the Maratha ditch, the British built. They got up to Delhi and they managed to essentially uh, reduce the Mughal emperor to a sort of hostage who uh, ruled in name, but was taking his orders from Marathas. They took a bit of a body blow in 1761 from the invading of Ghans, Amach Abdali, but Abdali didn't intend to stay in rule, unlike the Mughals. He just wanted the Mughals to go back. So the Marathas would have recovered, except that, of course, the British uh, were able to trump the magic. So political unity, there's plenty of arguments for it. Just to finish finally on the civilizational point, to one is going to talk about uh, tracts of Hindu pilgrimage. I don't want people to think this is again falling into the trap of a Hindu for argument. It's not. Because Maulana Azad, the great nationalist, uh, who is of course a Muslim divine, wrote at the beginning of the 20th century about the fact that Indian Muslims traveling on the Hajj to Mecca, whether they were Pathans in the Northwest or Tamils in the Southeast, were all regarded by the other Muslims, principally the Arabs, of course, in, in, in the Gulf, as Hindi. They were all seen as from one civilizational space. So the notion of India as one both predates the British and survived the British political dominion that uh, that was. And, 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 and at the end of anything, the one thing the British did that no one had done before was to divide this unity through the partition of India in 1947. So <clears throat> the second argument of use by the Roberts is and folks is democracy. The British came to democracy. You wouldn't be an MP today, but for the fact. <laughs> well, it's like, rather be a senator, thank you, but <laughs> No, I mean, the truth is that if you really look uh, at the question of democracy, it's a bit rich to arrest, torture, maim, imprison, uh, 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 transport, exile large numbers of people and then celebrate the fact uh, that they're democratic at the end of it. What have, you, what have you done to build that democracy when you've actually attempted to withhold it uh, throughout all this time? There's example after example I do provide in my book of um, opportunities not missed but deliberately foregone by the British to extend substantive uh, self-government to Indians. In fact, the private correspondence of viceroys and so on indicates very clearly that the professions, uh, the public statements of associating Indians with, the, with their own governance were only meant for public consumption and privately their actual idea was quite the opposite. And we've got example after example of that. I won't belabor the point. But to give you a couple of instances, there was no question about the fact that when, uh, when the First World War was fought, for example, uh, Mahatma Gandhi himself and pretty much every other Indian leader decided to support the war effort, uh, partially, or one would even argue principally, because the British hinted that there would be rewards at the end of it. And the rewards, it was pretty much explicitly uh, stated would be dominion status along the lines of the so-called white convert. That is, the queen would remain on the king by then. So like New Zealand, like, like New Zealand, Canada, Australia, yeah. South Africa, Canada at that point, etc. Uh, et uh, and uh, this is the spirit in which, which the Indians went in long. And then there's this, this hilarious sort of yes minister moment when uh, uh, a declaration is to be issued by the Secretary of State for India in 1917, essentially making this commitment uh, in black and white and go on the floor of the house. And Curzon steps in, uh, very much like guest minister, and introduces a whole bunch of uh, clauses that, that soften and condition and, and ifs and buts all over the place um, to, to weaken the, the to dilute the commitment. And sure enough, at the end of the war, the Vidya Zambian does not grant the self-government promise. Disturbances break out. We have the violence imposed by the British police like Jalewalabad, where they, they killed large numbers of, of, of peacefully gathered Indians. And the result at the end of all of that was a further setback, which really could only be reversed by Mahatma Gandhi and the entire change of the nationalist movement 
from English educated lawyers decorously submitting petitions which went straight into the waste paper bill into a mass movement and a popular upset that the British found increasingly untenable to resist. But, would say, you'll vote at this point, what about the civil service? We have a big cast here, a, a, a glowing example of the incorruptibility of the civil service as trained by generations of, of ICS officers. Well, I can give you a number of exhibits, and I do in the book, but you know, you have the, and you have the, the, the sad stories of those Indians who actually did take the British at their word and tried to get into the civil service. I recount three or four such stories, every one of them factual and footnoted. Um, one was a, 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 a brilliant chap who came first in the examination civil service. They tried to mark him down during the oral interviews, but they couldn't mark him down enough, so he still made it to the ICS. Um, and and um, they spent his entire first few years of service figuring out ways of drumming him up until finally he was expelled for a very minor infraction, which uh, no Englishman would even have been wrapped in the knuckles for. Uh, for requesting and writing accommodation in the civil lines for himself and his family. Uh, and he was expelled from the ICS for that. Second example was uh, uh, a gentleman I read about in memoir by a British ICS officer, uh, uh, a young man from a prosperous South Indian family, a Chetty, who was sent off to Harrow and Eaton, places like that, to be educated, went to Cambridge, got a first, a first class first, I believe, joined the civil service. Having allowed himself in the course of his education in England to think of himself as no different from the English he was studying with, but he came back to India as an ICS man and tried to, to behave as it were the same way and was absolutely treated with disdain because of the color of his skin. To the extent that he found, for example, that though he had official positions in keeping with the ICS status he had, he wasn't able to exercise any of them because the English would gather in the club and make all their decisions in the smoking room or at the card table. And when he applied to join the club, he would let all and never get a fish. And the poor fellow in the end shot himself because his, he, he could not do his career. And so on and so forth, I give many other examples. These were the, so to suggest that the British in this great enlightened moment created a civil service and did everything to steer Indians up in here. And every single thing that Indians got, they fought for, they, they were thwarted uh, up and down and sideways by the British in these positions. And even the relatively enlightened, for example, the man who wrote this book, Feely Ho, uh, in the same memoir in which he's revealing all of these things, says that it's unacceptable to imply that Indians can be treated on a par with English people. He actually blames the, 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 the British naivety even admitting a man like Chetty. He says the government of England, of India, must be done by Englishmen. That's the whole point of it. And he's completely unaware of the irony of what he's writing. So it's very, very difficult to suggest that there was any conscious effort. Indians, frankly, really broke through in a big way only after the First World War and the flower of the English youth were killed on the battlefields and the trenches. And suddenly there was a general shortage of young white men for pretty much anything, uh, other than perhaps bouncing in Paris in the 1920s. Uh, you actually had, uh, for example, a white assembly policy in the Indian railways, where every position from station master to ticket collector had to be occupied only by white men. But after the First World War, they had to expand the recruitment pool. And then, of course, these bright Indians with their uh, high education and so on get in. I've quoted. Uh, writers going as far back as the 1840s. Uh, to their credit, the House of Commons did frequently have testimony on what was going on in India. And there was one, pretty, uh, one, one British official who said in the 1840s to the House of Commons that if uh, uh, Englishmen with a tenth of the talent of some of the Indians were being relegated to subsidiary positions, uh, were placed in positions of such greater authority over these people, then, uh, I'm sorry, I've expressed it back. I think what he said was that the Indians were ten times the talent of the British who were placed above them. If they were given real authority, they would run their country better than we could, or words to that effect. So there was always the sense that the Indians uh, could have done much more. The British overpaid, vastly overpaid, multiples, not of 10 or 20 times what Indians were getting for. Any, any government work, but a hundred times 
uh, plus a guaranteed pension after 20 years, uh, and, and of course the furloughs home and all of that. The English received in terms of government of India expenditure, which is from Indian sources and Indian taxpayers, 110 times the total expenditure of the British government on Indian nationals in India. So there's absolutely nothing to suggest that the civil service is something we owe to the British. But, would say Andrew Roberts at this point, the rule of law. Well, uh, <laughs> the rule of law was applied with excessive deference uh, and excessive regard to the skin color of the defendant. Uh, again, I want to give you example after example. Um, you know, in the entire 200 years of British colonial, there were only four cases where Englishmen were convicted for killing Indians, and every one of them was absolutely egregious, where it was impossible to kick out the traces. There were, in the average year, about 200 cases of Indians being killed by Englishmen, not one of whom was convicted. The most, one of the most common ways in which Indians died was being kicked in the stomach by their English employers. And this most extraordinary justification was, was drawn up by the British uh, jurisprudence uh, of the day, which said that most Indians were malarial and therefore had enlarged um, spleens. And that actually, when the Englishman kicked his Indian subordinate, the Indian was not dying of the kick, but of a ruptured spleen caused by his own fault that he had malaria. So that was, and therefore, the Englishman was usually either let off completely scot free or asked to pay 30 shillings to the widow or some such. Some. Uh, and I think the worst case we could find were one, two, three days. There's a Canadian scholar who's done a very, very good detailed study of all these cases. And again, I give many other examples, but there's no question about the fact that race was absolutely meant right up to the very end, practically, it was impossible for an Indian judge to try an English defendant, uh, and so on and so forth. It was, this is not rule of law, uh, as you all would understand it today, with the, you know, the, the blindfolded uh, lady holding the scales of justice. She has the blindfold one eye up, but she sees a white defendant, uh, and that's how those judgments were passed. But, <coughs> as Roberts would say, what about the railways? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite one, actually, because the railways. The railways were actually built in India about the same time as here in Canada. But what was interesting was that there was an explicit justification written by the then government, Lord Dalazi, as early as 1843. He said, listen, this new thing has been invented. We need to bring it to India for two purposes. One, to extract more resources from the hinterland and bring it to the ports to ship to England, and second, to send more troops in deep into the country to quell unrest. So the entire purpose of building the railway lines was purely to advance British interests. Then, the railways were entirely paid for by Indian funds, Indian taxpayers, and, and Indian revenues, but British investors in the railways were guaranteed double the rate of return of the highest British security at the time. So you couldn't make a better investment in the London Stock Exchange between roughly the 18, mid-1840s and mid-1870s than buying stock in the Indian railways because they spent money hand over fist since they weren't paying for it. And they reimbursed these people who made the investment at a rate they couldn't get anywhere else. So every mile of Indian railway costs nine times the mile of Indian railway, of, of railway being built in Canada or the US at the very same time. On top of that, they ran it, as I said, as a racist enterprise, quite simply. They, uh, when Indians started developing in talent for repairing repressive things, they were shut down. At one point, Indians actually manufactured a locomotive themselves uh, in what was the big old province of today's Bihar. Uh, and the British closed it down, so you can't do this. Uh, this should only be done in Europe. And even when the demand for locomotives and so on exceeded what Britain could produce, they would only buy them in other European countries. They would not have them made in India. So, again, one last point is that the railways were not just there to pursue to, for, for British interest. They had to obviously attach passenger cabins as well. Eventually, as Indians wanted to hitch rides on this, this iron machine running through their lands, uh, and these were wretched, wretched, wretched passenger compartments, I can tell you with slack-like benches as the only place to sit, uh, if it's all you had a chance to sit, and so on. The Indian passengers paid the highest passenger rates of any railway in the world 
Whereas the British company should be goods on the railways, paid the lowest freight rates of any railway in the world. So the priorities are made explicit by that alone, all of which had to be reversed after independence. Perhaps reversed too far, because now our passengers travel for next to nothing, and, uh, and, and our, our companies are not able to afford to ship things on railways. But at least I'm just saying that none of so the, the, the short answer to all your objections. Well, we, have one, we have one more. But we say, but we say the critics. What about team cricket? Ah. Well, you know, uh, Canada is the wrong country to say this in, but cricket, according to the Indian sociologist Akish Nandi, is really an Indian game accidentally. So, uh, because uh, that was grossly unsuitable for cricket. Uh, and, you know, Hindu fatalism, you know, where the fate of the game can be settled by the cost of a coin, the passage of a cloud, the spatter of raindrops on a pitch. How can, how can that not be an Indian game, right? <laughs> and then at the end of five days, you might battle your way to a hard-fought draw. And Americans and Canadians are going to five days and you still have a draw at the end of it. But in India, we know that the journey is more important than the destination. So cricket is really an Indian game. <laughs> tea. Tea. Well, tea is actually quite unique. The British, the British were getting tea from China. And, uh, of course, it was expensive. On its trade, narcotics. Narcotics on one side and tea on the other. And the, uh, the, the tea was getting more and more expensive. So they said, why don't we actually try to grow the damn thing with the part of Asia we actually rule? So they said, let's grow tea in India. So they sent off a secret agent. And this is absolutely God's truth. With the improbable name of Robert Fortune. And Robert Fortune went off to China to steal tea bushes. And he stole tea bushes and they kept dying on the ship on the voyage back to India. So the British pretty much gave up on this until the wandering Scotsman, uh, no doubt by the name of Dan Rippon, stumbled across a plant in Assam that he thought looked on the 19th, so he did all that you do to try and see whether it is tea, and he found it was. Well, it's more, the tea was actually more robust and therefore more likely to be of the, uh, the, you know, to the taste of the, the British palate than, than the slightly pale and, and weak uh, Chinese tea. Anyway, so they started making tea, but right up to the 1930s, they made it principally for the English market. Uh, 95 or 94 percent of all the tea grown in India was exported. It was only when the Great Depression came along and the British housewife and the tea shops could no longer afford to import tea that the British were forced to discover an Indian market for tea. And they, they had to dump vast quantities of unsold tea on Indians, and of course Indians happily took to it, and now there is not the remotest village in our country where you can't get a cup of chai. But again, so the, the short answer, as I was saying to every question you've asked, is every single thing now being pointed to as a virtue by the British, as something they quote-unquote gave India, was only brought into India for themselves, to advance their interests, to enhance their profits, to improve their lifestyles, or specifically be taken to England. But the fact that when they left, they couldn't take all these with them, and therefore the Indians were left with them, is very little to the credit of the British because when they had the opportunity, they did not choose to share any of these genuinely with Indians. They were there to facilitate the British colonial enterprise. So, to move on in a sense from the arguments that you've laid out in the books to uh, the criticisms. Of your, of your position. Now he's getting to be the English one. <laughs> um, so, Titanka Roy, um, a very serious uh, economist, um, and of a more right wing bent than yourself, uh, based in the LSE, has made a number of points, and it's been interesting of the book. Um, and I just shoot him at you and you just shoot that. Um, his criticism was that you made the argument very strongly in a sense of traditional national value, that the, the British destroyed Indian industries, particularly the textile industry, with a view to throwing their own manufacturers into India in, in an unfair way, and that this killed off the Indian industry. But according to Tatanka, Indian exports nonetheless continued to rise year by year, uh, with the exception of, 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 I think it was 1820 to 1840, when there was a, a, a global depression. But otherwise, every year, 
from, in the middle, even in the most attractive periods of the company, Indian exports rose year by year. And that Indian businessmen actually did very well out of this. So all the Parsi fortunes, uh, Parsi going off to Hong Kong and, and you know, joining in the narcotic industry. The great uh, Gujarat diaspora in East Africa had been there already, but, but given new opportunities under the umbrella of empire. So Tatanka's view uh, is that, in a sense, that you've misdirected your attack. And he says that what he regards the principal failure of the British and India was not that they crushed industry, because he argued that, they, that, that while they certainly hobbled some parts of industry, they provided other opportunities. And if they crushed some towns, as about Calcutta rose up to replace it. But he would argue that the biggest failure of the British, something you don't talk about in the book, was actually in rural development. That they just weren't interested, at, except for the Punjab, where there were these massive irrigation schemes. That the whole of the Deccan, for example, was left unirrigated. And one of the most remarkable achievements post independence in India was the ease with which quite basic irrigation uh, projects ended starvation, ended um, uh, uh, famines, uh, and you know, there was then, in addition to that, the Green Revolution, which, which increased crop yields. But the, he said that the, the British simply weren't interested, and what they used to hold up in their own writings as a virtue, that you know, one Saab with a solar topi, um, you know, keeping peace with a million Indians, right, actually was negligence, because it shouldn't have been one Saab, it should have been a thousand, but they should have been engaged in irrigation works, they could have very easily doubled and quadrupled the productivity. What would you argue? So on that point, I actually agree. In fact, I've, I've actually written the book going back to the late 1700s when they first started moving this on, that unlike any previous Indian rulers, they took the revenues and shifted off to England. They had absolutely no interest in local improvements. So every king, however rapacious, had built bridges and serais and inns and, 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 and other kinds of local works, including, I mean, not large-scale irrigation, but the technology wasn't there, but whatever kinds of local irrigation could be done. And he cuts and so on. Uh, but when the British came, that ceased. His revenues were not spent at all in the areas in which the revenues were taken, they were sent off. So there I agree that, in fact, it's actually worse because when you crushed industry in a place like Mushidabad, what happened to these weavers who lost their jobs? They flooded into the countryside, which was unprepared to receive them because there was no work for them there. And the phenomenon of landless labor was created as a result of labor being displaced from cities. Mushidabad is a city in Begon, which became one of the first cities in the history of urbanization to lose population after having uh, been a, a very popular... It was the size of London, and it became the size of, of sort of uh, New York. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it just, just went down. It was Dhaka also, the deindustrialization of Mushidabad and Dhaka, both saw significant depopulation. Uh, but, but on the first point you make of exports going up, there are two things there. I think the are being a bit disingenuous and not admitting that some of the figures of Indian exports actually also include British companies exporting uh, from India. And, uh, and therefore, it wasn't just Indians making money. But secondly, there's no comparison between the degree to which Indian exports went up between, let's say, the 1790s and the 1880s uh, and, and the comparable figures for other countries' exports, particularly Britain's, which went up by a factor of several dozen fold of what the Indians went up. So in terms of potential, see India had been a textile exporting country for over 2,000 years when the British came. We know from, for example, Pliny the Elder uh, that uh, there were debates in the Roman Senate in which Roman senators, you know, uh, first century after, after Christ, are complaining that most of Rome's gold and silver stuck in India because of the weakness of Roman women for Indian women and Muslims and so forth. So that was the, 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 the history of one. And, and their studies, in fact, the Iranga himself features in one of my footnotes for, for, the, ship, for, the, for the textile export. And the study is showing that uh, India was a dominant exporter of textiles. The British initially the came to buy them. The world's largest exporter. It was, worth not. In fact, there was are... Was it even the industrialization in Mexico? Because so much Indian, Indian textiles making its way right across the world. Exactly. And in fact, in, in England, in the 16th and 17th centuries, there are accounts of English shopkeepers having been arrested and so on for trying to palm off European-made cloth as made in India, because made in India was the hallmark of global quality. 
uh, for, for, for cloth, linens, textiles, chintz, all of these things. Anyway, to cut a long story short, that when the, the East India Company first came to trade, then they realized if you trade with a gun in your hand, you trade much better. Uh, and they did indeed. And then, of course, once they started controlling territory, it was an amazing situation because you exact taxes from the peasants you're ruling and you spend their money buying the goods you had come here to buy in the first place and shipping them off to England. I think these are going to be hard pressed to make an argument that includes all of these points and still say that the, uh, the British had done all right. I think there were certainly some developments, but when you think about the fact that Indians had been prospering before the British came and prospered a good deal less than they might have, and what is more than others, and particularly Britain, prospered much more. I mean, you know, really, we've talked about this. Um, uh, Horace Walpole writing, uh, uh, just taking a carriage down a street in London, I've forgotten the name of the street, it's in the book, uh, and describing mansion after mansion after mansion built with money that has come from India. Uh, one writer called London a sinkhole of Indian wealth. And this is in the 1780s. That's very important. You know, what's my problem? So there you are. So, the final, before we move back to the party and, and, and this, is, is my own criticism and one that um, was the, you said the biggest surprise I found when researching the anarchy. And, and when I've been taking the anarchy around England, the stuff I've been saying is very much the same sort of thing you've been saying, stressing the looting, the, 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 the profit motive for the British, the asset stripping, and that sort of thing. But when I've been writing about this book in Indian papers now, um, there are other things, harder truths, which I think Indians should recognize, and which is an important part of the story, which you totally do not mention in your book. And that is the whole question of collaboration. Yes. And th let me lay out my... The Jagat Sikhs, so for a second. So the Jagat Sikhs. So when you very sweetly and generously reviewed my book, you made a very interesting slip. Because in the review, you said um, that, that, that Clive, um, Clive bribed Mir Jaffa not to fight at uh, 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 Plassey, which was the very first opening. But that actually was not what I wrote. And what I wrote, and what comes very clearly in the correspondence, the detail of the thing, was that Clive was in having retaken Calcutta and having conquered the French pr province of Chandanagar, was all set to return to Madras because they feared that the French fleet was going to come. And at this point, he receives an offer out of the blue from the Jagat set, the, the Rothschild of India, the richest banker in India, in, 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 who offers him personally two million pounds and a company of 20 million pounds if they will unseat Siraj Gowda because Siraj Gowda had insulted him, threatened to circumcise him, and was uh, threatening him with the whole if he didn't lend money against his will. So Clive, the very first British move on Mashidabad was not the British bribing a Mashidabad general. They were being pulled into an existing palace plot, which was being orchestrated by the Jagat Sets, who had put the dynasty in there in the first place, because the, the dynasty of Mushid Kuli Khan, who, after whom Mashidabad was named, was put in place by the Jagat Sets in the, whatever it was, 1740s. And then they were having a second group to try and get rid of them and replace them with Mir Jaffa. And this remained a constant thing throughout the rise of the company. Throughout the whole company period, there were never more than 2,000 British factors and civil servants at work in India. And the extraordinary story which is a bizarre and bonkers story, but one that actually does need to be thought over and considered by Indians today, because it contains many lessons, fortunately, is that the British not only conquered India very largely with Indian troops that they raised and trained, they did it with loans Indian money. from Indian bankers. And that the, particularly the Marwaris, the Jagat Sets, the Ossian Jains, uh, and all the other groups on the coast actually provided the money and it's very important to ask why. It wasn't just that they were treacherous or um, you know cartoon bad. There were a number of reasons that they decided to put their choice on the company as the least worst option uh, in, a, in a period of great uncertainty and rather than dismissing them merely as traitors and so on to try and put ourselves into the why would these people choose 
to buy a foreign company with foreigners in a different language, a different religion, who had plundered and shown their perfidiousness from an early point. Why were these magnitudes? The answer is because they knew that their capital would be safer with them. It's a profit, a straightforward decision of profits. And they was, the capital was safer because the East India Company liked the finances themselves. It was about business. They knew that they were going to get their money back with interest on time, that they could enforce their contracts in the court of law, uh, and that commercially, that they were going to have a better bet. So they, not just the Japanese sense, but also well, the bankers of Canaris, the bankers of Patna, the whole Indian financial system, which was huge and sophisticated and rich, made a conscious decision, not once, but over and over again, from the 1750s, the 1760s, the 1770s, and particularly in the 1780s and 1800s, to back the company. They did it because they thought it was more stable and it was and it was actually then you get the second thing after the permanent settlement when Cornwallis reorganizes the land holdings of, of Bengal, which then of course are in local hands. You have a few very large Nawabs, often who come in from Persia or, 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 or Afghanistan, or, or in the case of Mir Jaffa, he's an Arab from Najaf, who own huge contract, huge, huge areas of Bengal. And Cornwallis puts it out for auction, and the people who buy it are the Hindu business families, uh, the, the future Madhuram of Calcutta. They're the Mullins, the Debs, the Tagores, these sort of families. And these families take the land and impregnate themselves into the British system. Again, for the same reason that it's not because they like the company, it's not because they think the company is wonderful. But given the choice of Tipu or the Marathas or the Moguls, they see the company as the least worst option. And it seems to me that you need, just like the British, very badly, need to introspect about the looting, the plunder, the massive human rights abuse, the massacres, and all that, and, and educate themselves on that. It seems to me that there are extremely important lessons trying to understand why a lot of Indians in the 18th century did choose to back the government. Yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to challenge the facts of that. You've done your research and I'm sure you're right. And in fact the Marxists will always tell you that every Indian enterprise involves a fair amount of Comprador capital. And you already mentioned earlier how you know Parsi businessmen, Marwani businessmen made money even out of the opium trade uh, in China. So certainly we've had various people profiting from it, but you know human beings would act in their self-interest. Under whatever dispensation the point is that in. A very contrary to, in a sense, the nationalist version of the story. Not just a few, but a great many people, particularly in Eastern India in the 18th century and the 19th century, made a conscious decision but I think that, that, that this was, this was the, the least worst. Thing. True, but you have to agree that these are short term calculations motivated by immediate considerations of self interest in a particular historical context. And that what I'm arguing now is a big picture, sort of 200 year sweep of, of cause and effect and legacy, which I think is not incompatible with the fact that I do mention in a couple of places uh, how much Indian venality has contributed to this. I mean, the numbers you mentioned, you said 2,000 factors. I mean, right up to the 20s, I think the peak of the British president in India was 1931, there are 110,000 soldiers. I mean, you know, for, to put down 300 million. Which was triple the number under the company, the cost. Yeah. When the mutiny took place, there were no in India. Was, they were just you know, garrisoning in India with, with Indian troops with tiny. Well, we can wind up, shall we? <laughs> anyway, a huge here. I mean, these are matters we can discuss. And we'll discuss again, I'm sure. But, but, but I think for all of you, if you're interested, the main thing to say is that there is an interesting story we tell. Told, William tells it very well. Uh, the narrative of the rise of the company in, in some detail, and I would encourage you to read this book. And there's also an argument to be made, and I put mine forward, uh, very much along the lines of William Elizabeth from me in my book. Uh, and there's probably another point of view that I want to The reason why this I think is that is that we are today the results of many things in the past, and have been shaped and formed by these 200 years of uh, the group, but have done uh, a great deal to make us who we are, to ensure that we pass an eye on in the language and have to put the good of the Muratas in that matter. I'm 
Well, the fact that you castles. But the fact is that we do need to come to terms. I'm very grateful that we have in really somebody who's actually willing to spend his life delving in great detail into all of these episodes of our recent past. And I encourage more Indians to come to terms with that. I, I don't think that any of us is writing the last word on any of this. And I passionately believe that there is room for further exploration, further understanding. Uh, when I think about it, I don't even think there are many, many books on the 20th century, are there? I mean, this entire, and they've moved more money than the Bank of England was moving in the beginning of the 18th century. And they indeed helped uh, finance the British conquest of India. But I guess we'll leave it a thank you, William. It was great to chat with you. Thank you all. Another round of applause for the lovely speakers. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Dr. Kalur. May I please request you to stay for a, for, for a minute and may I please invite uh, one of our lead partners, CEO of uh, Cargo Jet, uh, Mr. Ajay Virmani, to come up and uh, felicitate the speakers. Mr. Ajay Virmani. somebody who has been the pillar of JLF Toronto. She's the one who has put everything together. Uh, my partner in crime, my very, very dear friend and executive director of JLF Toronto, Shrinka Walia, to come up here and do both of us.
including our TLF Toronto 2019 advisors, Adele Robinson, Susie and Len Rodgers, Deepak and Meera Chopra, Melanie Hurley, Tarsi Rao, and Sabi Mahima, who have made introductions, guided us, provided insight, and yes, I have to admit, who have been tormented by emails and phone calls from me. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. My lead of extraordinary people, Melanie, Susie, Poonam, Rinal, Ankit, and Neha, who have devoted endless volunteer hours and are in their power to make this festival the best of the Grateful thanks to Menamshi Alim Chandani and Mr. And a shout out to my executive producer, Chris Kula, and my wonderful colleagues on the other side of the world, Jenny Kapoor, and celebrating And certainly, last but not least, to the city of Toronto, the new proudly Canadian home of the Thank you to the incredible staff at Economic Development and Culture for your most meaningful support, your guidance, your enthusiasm, and your affirmation every step of the way. We are indeed fortunate to live in a city that views and encourages festivals like TLF as opportunities to engage its citizens, create platforms for debate and dialogue, build and strengthen its communities and celebrate the diversity that surrounds us every day. And to all of you, for the next few days, I hope you will take in all that JLF Toronto has to offer. Powerful conversations by some incredible minds. A free street outdoor festival and with some wonderful airports. We hope you bring charge and in charge or perhaps and tapas. We hope we check out our vendors like the baby home and be moved by performances by Kirat Kaur and the Sampradaya group. We hope you snap and chat, listen and engage. We hope you find yourselves immersed, perhaps even transformed, in the 15 powerful conversations that are each other's stories. But most of all, I hope you will leave the stories of your own. Welcome to TLF Toronto 2019. And as they say, dinner is served. Thank you.